Welcome everyone. We have uh, the very first inaugural session of our international webinar series. Learning to lead early and uh, I'm so glad to have uh, esteemed panelists as uh, Neil Barker and Jerry with us. Uh, welcome both of you. It's, it's an honor to have you with us. Neil, how are you doing? Oh, good, thank you. Yes, lovely to be with you. Afternoon here, of course, for um, yeah. those of us who are joining from Australia. Hopefully there's a few viewers out there as well, but lovely to be here. Hi, Jerry. Hello. Great to be here. Looking forward to the afternoon session or morning session for you. Uh, learning to lead early brought to you by OneFold is a one stop solution for all the organizational lead, uh, needs. And uh, we are collaborating, Indra Pram Group of Institutions is collaborating with OneFold. And um, we happen to have nine institutions, uh, six schools, and three colleges in three different cities. And we are hoping to have wonderful next two, three months. And I'm hoping by then the COVID would uh, probably say bye bye and we'll be off into the normal routine again. This entire month, we are engaging with Australia. We have already lined up four webinars. Uh, rest, uh, the rest of the series we'll be announcing very soon. We hope to have one month long engagement with Australia. Um, minimum five webinars, if not more. This is what our plan is. And then subsequently we intend to take Finland and UK. Uh, we have um, Neil Barker, who happens to be director with Neil Barker Consulting. He's a formal director with Besto Institute of uh, Educational Leadership. Mm -hmm. And um, we also have, Ger have uh, Gary here, uh, Jerry here, who is uh, uh, managing talent management and global connections at Besto Institute of uh, Leadership, Education Leadership, uh, Melbourne. My association with Neil goes uh, way back to 2015 when um, I was filling up this form for Endeavour Award and he was supposed to be my host in uh, during my tenure of fellowship. And um, um, I met uh, Jerry in 2016. I actually traveled to Melbourne and uh, with both of them, uh, it has been a, I think uh, I need to thank uh, so at, at the, on this platform, I also take this opportunity to thank them for the lovely learning experiences that I had in Melbourne and Best Institute of Education Leadership in particular, which happens to be North Mel Melbourne. Um, this Besto Institute is actually an arm of, um, I think, Victoria's Department of Edu um, Education and Training. And uh, they they have a lovely work, a lot of framework they have designed. There's a whole lot of uh, uh, leadership courses that run in that institute throughout the year and they are catering for all, all levels of leadership and there's been an amazing set of uh, course curriculums that was exposed to and it has been a uh, great learning for me and great exposure to me because that was a time when Indira Pram Group was actually trying to set up a leadership center in uh, our uh, uh, in Delhi, Delhi NCR and that is with that thought I had traveled there and um, Yes, with Neil, uh, so many interactions I had with Neil and there was a whole lot of learning. The learning of those four or five years ago, I wanted to bring it forward and bring it to India and I really wanted everybody to get exposed to that. Though we will be talking more of what happens in BESTO, how BESTO teaches their uh, future leaders, but uh, I would request Neil and uh, Jerry to uh, tell us a little in, in the light of uh, not really what Department of Education and Training does in, Mel uh, in Victoria. How we can, because what I see over here is we have uh, about 80, 85% attendance from India. Then we have a few from Australia. And then we also have people from uh, UAE. Then we have Indonesia and we have Kuwait. So this is my uh, read, uh, data of yesterday evening, with which my team shared with me. So we have at least five country people listening to you, Neil and Jerry. I start uh, today with, uh, I think, uh, Jerry, we will uh, take you up first. Let me read up a little about Jerry. Jerry has been a great contributor, to, contributor in the field of education. Uh, Geraldine uh, Weil, we call her Jerry has Master of Education from the University of Melbourne and has worked in education for close to 30 years. Jerry has led a range strategic education initiative across the higher education, industry and corporate sectors. 
and Australian international aid programs which focus on leadership development and building workforce capability. Jerry has worked at Bestro since its inception. That's 2009, 21 years. It's, uh, what is it? My God, uh, 11 years, OK, and has most recently led the development of talent management framework for the Victorian government schools. The Bestro talent management framework approach which identifies, develops and supports high potential school leaders is unique, not just in Australia, but globally. The framework has been specifically designed for the school system. The framework and the supporting resources have taken two years to develop and pilot with system leaders, principals and teachers. I invite Gary to give us an insight into this framework that specifically this framework that we talk about. Then we'll take up a conversation further. Over to you, Jerry. Thank you, Rita. Um, I'm just wondering whether you could um, put up the presentation that um, I sent through. That would be great so that I can talk to that. What? We need the presentation of Jerry's. While we're finding um, the presentation, um, thank you for the opportunity to um, share what we've learned around our talent management framework. The reason why we decided to go down the path of setting up a framework that everyone could use was that we found that our schools were selecting leaders, but in a very narrow focus around leadership, and it was very ad hoc. So what we wanted to do was create a framework that everyone could use in schools to give some consistency and transparency to the way that we select our leaders, how we identify them, how we develop them, and then how we supported them. So this framework was developed with principals and teachers and our system leaders, and that's why it took two years to develop. And it's working with them that we came up with this, all these list of resources to support the implementation of this framework. So just, I'll take you through the framework. There's three key elements to it, as I've mentioned. One is about how you identify your leaders. So we had, a, this is a very strong focus here to make sure that this process is equitable and transparent. And so it looks at not just people's performance, current performance, but also thinking about what their potential is to be a leader. Um, and also a, a focus on readiness. Are they ready to step up and be a leader? And in this planning for uh, selection, we also want to select people that aren't necessarily ready to be a leader tomorrow, but perhaps with development and support could step up into a leadership position in three months, six months or 12 months. So once we've selected uh, the person, we then put around a very rigorous plan around how they can be further developed. And we do this um, in line with some gaps around their capabilities and we offer them development opportunities, not just sending them off to university courses, that is an element of it, but we also create opportunities for them to learn on the job and also from others. And this is, our schools really like this approach because it doesn't take our teachers out of the classroom, it creates opportunities within the school and they can demonstrate their leadership with their peers in the school. Um, and then we also make sure that these leaders potential leaders get support from mentors in the school and experts outside of the schools as well too. So they're identified and they also get a very structured development and support brought around them to ensure their success. So the what you can see on the screen is all the tools that we've developed to support this process. So it's easy for schools to use and that there's a consistency there as well too. So there's actually 43 tools um, and that's to make sure that when schools take up this opportunity to use this framework, they can pick up a tool and they know exactly what to do. There's, although there's 43 tools, um, we suggest that there's 13 um, resources that they must use to make sure that this process works correctly. But the other ones are built around communications, um, and administration so that they can document this process as well too. So it's a, a really well thought out approach to this framework. So that's the overview. I'll just go into a little bit more detail in the next slide around um, identify and what we're trying to do there. So we know that everyone has the potential to learn, but this framework is really about identifying leaders. 
So we're looking for people who have that high potential to lead others in their school. Um, like your amazing um, cricket team, we're really wanting to um, plan for future leaders coming through. So we're looking at their performance, how are they performing maybe in their classroom. They might be a good um, teacher um, and they're um, great at the curriculum, they're great at teaching, great at managing um, behaviours, they're very generous with their peers as well too. But what we're also looking for is potential. So that's potential to be a leader. And that means that people would naturally gravitate to these people because they're very generous with their information, they support others, they're willing to take on challenges, they'll step up, they're willing to reflect on their learning and they're always looking to, to grow their capabilities. So not just looking at they're good already at their job, we're looking at do they want to stretch themselves, do they want to grow their capabilities. And as I said, we also have to look at readiness. Are they ready to take on these extra responsibilities? Are they ready to go um, that extra mile to um, learn something new? And so these are the people that we say are our high potentials. These are the people that we want to invest in with development and support opportunities to grow their leadership potential. Thanks, so we'll move on to the next slide. So for us in Australia, um, we needed to consider how we could identify our uh, leaders early on um, because uh, interestingly enough, uh, the principal role isn't um, a popular idea of um, people like being a middle leader, but it's a big stretch to step up to the responsibility of being a principal. And um, so we have to look at in trying to encourage people to think about that leadership journey early on. What we're finding is some of our great teachers after about four or five years in schools, because they're great leaders, will naturally drift away from our education sector and look for other opportunities um, outside of education. Well, we want to keep those people and we want to encourage them to look forward to leadership opportunities. Interestingly, our principals uh, love their job and um, when asked again, you know, would they be a, a principal, they say yes, absolutely, but they wouldn't necessarily recommend that job to other people. Um, so we have to start changing our stories and talking about how amazing it can be to be a principal. And interestingly, um, a number of our principals, a high percentage of our principals said that they wouldn't necessarily have thought to be a principal unless someone nudged them into the role and tapped them on the shoulder. And what we want to do is be more systematic about how we select people. We don't just want individuals selecting individuals. We actually want a systematic approach to identifying our uh, leaders. And that brings me to um, some of the other information that I've got on this slide, which is a really interesting um, situation where we have this unconscious bias around our selections and we naturally select people that are like us or that we um, get on with really well. They might be similar in age or gender, they might have similar cultural backgrounds. So what we see in Australia, although we've got a very diverse culture, um, our leadership pipeline is um, quite narrow. So we want this framework to be used so that we can expand um, people's ideas about who they might be selecting for uh, leadership potential. And we do this by um, getting a leadership team together and thinking about um, who they're selecting and why, so that people can challenge people's assumptions about individuals and we can get a broader perspective on who might be um, good to be a leader in this school. And what we've found already is that uh, there's more women that are being selected um, and some of our women work part time as well too. So they're being selected to develop their leadership capabilities so that when they come back to school, that they are able to move that up that leadership um, into more senior roles when they come back full time. Because many of our women have decided to step away from education because they, they think perhaps by the time they get back to school, that people will have progressed up the leadership ladder and they'll have been left behind. So this framework is starting to address some of those issues. 
The next slide, please. So we are identifying people not just ready to step up into that principal role in a couple of years. What we're looking for is to think about those high flying teachers, those excellent teachers that have leadership potential in the classroom and helping them think about the, their journey through to being a school leader. So we say that there's four key steps that it takes to get to be a principal. What we see is um, people moving from the classroom into um, informal roles where they'll run team meetings and have a small project that they run with um, their peers. Stepping up again to what we call our team leadership roles, which are the middle leaders that run teams. It's a formal position. They run teams. They're responsible for large group, um, large curriculum areas or large um, uh, other roles in the school. So they've got an expanded um, responsibility that's not just based in the classroom, but across the school opportunities. And then there's a big jump to the uh, what we have is assistant principals and principals in the school. So and this is a, a, a huge jump for people to make from middle leaders to uh, senior leaders in the school and taking responsibility for the whole school approach. So we're trying to prepare those middle leaders to have exposure to opportunities, um, running finance, budgets, um, managing challenging conversations with other uh, staff or dealing with um, challenging situations with students. We're trying to give them broad exposure before they actually step up into that role. And we've even looked at a further step, which we call a system leader. And a system leader is someone uh, that looks after a, a number of schools and takes on that responsibility to coordinate schools, not just their own schools, but responsibilities of bringing the um, outcomes to students across a large number of schools. And to define each of those steps, we've broken down these areas into leadership capabilities. Those leadership capabilities include teaching and learning, developing self and others, leading improvements, innovation and change, leading the management of the school and engaging and working with the community. So of course, those capabilities, are we look at those for the teacher in the classroom, but their level of leadership capabilities would obviously look different to those that are for someone that is at a system leadership level. And so we, we've graduated those capabilities. And so people can have conversations and say, look, I want to step up into that team leadership role. How do I develop my capabilities in developing self and others to step up into that role? So we can have those deep conversations once they've been identified to, tell, to look at how they can be developed and supported to develop those capabilities. So to the people that I've put up on our screen, um, there's some great stories around Monica. Um, she's a person that um, didn't think she'd ever be a, a leader. Um, and she was identified through this process through her uh, leadership team. And um, she had she was working part time. They gave her some extra responsibilities. She came back to school for a year and then she applied for a principal role. And she, yeah, so she's had 18 months now as a primary principal. Aaron, um, he always knew that he wanted to be a leader, but he had some gaps in his uh, capabilities. But through this um, leadership steps framework, we were able to identify what Aaron's gaps were and put in place some development opportunities and support opportunities. And he's now an assistant secondary principal of a very large metropolitan school. Um, both of these people look quite young. They are in their 30s. Um, but this is one of the things that we want to do. We want to progress people not just on age, but on their ability to take on the role. So these are very capable people leading their schools. The next slide, please. Thank you. So the outcomes for us, what we've seen and, and we, we measure this impact is that for an individual, 
they have these conversations with principals and that they're told that they have leadership capability. And that can really change people's perspective about their career in education. And um, we're finding that it is keeping people inspired about staying on in education and thinking about their career progression and planning for that. So it's not an immediate um, jump that they're going to get, but they can see what they can achieve over you know, two to five years. On average for our principals, it takes about uh, 19 years to become a principal, but we're not saying it should be time-based. It should be um, developing these capabilities and being able to demonstrate that you can have um, take on extra responsibilities and being given opportunities to do that. For our schools, um, we certainly see that um, there's more succession planning happen, happening in the schools, particularly for our smaller schools, they can plan where the gaps are with their, their capabilities so they can start developing up their uh, teachers in the classroom to take on uh, middle leadership roles when it's their schools that are hard to get people to move to. So they're developing up their talent within their school. And they're also distributing leadership as well too. For, system, for our system, we um, are interested in building this stronger pipeline of people that are highly qualified and experienced to be able to progress through to being a principal. And we wanna be able to see um, over the next five years, a really increased interest in the principal role and we want to see people that are highly qualified to do that role. So this is why we went down this um, pathway for looking at developing our high potential leaders and already we're seeing successes with um, this approach. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it was um, the that three key three key criteria that you talked about of uh, identifying high potential leaders, performance, potential, and readiness. I mean uh, that actually uh, uh, it resonates with another model that uh, I think University of Illinois that had come up with. They talked about uh, they had this um, they did a survey and they had an experiment they carried out. Uh, a uh, 15 week academic uh, uh, course uh, and they tried out, they did a survey, they realized that uh, um, to improve the leadership skills, the participants had to have these kind of, the model was called ready, willing and able model. So and I think I can correlate the readiness with the, your readiness and willingness or readiness and the performance with the able ability or whatever. So uh, what you in Australia or in Victoria has probably come to arrive at. It's probably other countries are also, I mean, leadership has to be the same whichever country or whichever place we are at, whether it's an educational leadership or otherwise. Thank you. I have a whole, of, uh, I have a whole of observations and questions, but I'll come back to you later. Let's hear Neil, Neil first. Uh, over to Neil. Neil. Neil Barker is the former director of um, Besto Institute of Educational Leadership based in Melbourne, Australia. He has long and varied career in education in Victoria, Australia, spanning more than 37 years. He has worked as an educator in juvenile justice settings, specialist in primary schools and at the Zoo Education Services, Victoria. He has undertaken education roles in emergency management and in the not-for-profit sector and in education policy as well. Neil has also worked as principal. That's nice, nice to note, and that is how it explains why he has got such a in-depth uh, on-ground and knowledge and percept uh, feel to the entire thing. He has been a principal for 10 years in one of the schools. As a director of Vesto Institute of Education Leadership between 2014 to 19, he has led significant growth of the institute, including increasing participation by more than 200%, expanding program reach into rural areas, introducing online learning, extending professional learning and system leadership, and leading educational, uh, sorry, le uh, educational leadership engagement national, nationally and internationally. Neil is now providing educational leadership services through his own private practice, together with the development of a number of performing arts project as a part of an arts collective. That's amazing. Leading to lead early, uh, better preparing. Okay, I, I, I before I uh, say what uh, Neil is going to say, 
I read his one of the papers which he yeah, which is uh, which he wrote for which was published by Center for Strategic Education, learning to lead early, better preparing emerging leaders to lead themselves and others. This is uh, where we take the uh, theme from. And when I read this paper and when we contacted Neil and then I subsequently Jerry, we immediately decided this is going to be our um, theme uh, for the uh, for this particular seminar. So this is where our uh, this thing goes from. Leading to lead early was the paper that is written and I would uh, uh, I'm actually I really like the paper and the way it has been formulated and how of course it correlates with the best of practices as well, but I would request Neil to um, take an open ended question. I don't really want to limit him because he's got so much to say. I would uh, and there's another question that one of the participants has also put up which correlates with our question. We wanted to speak out to uh, talk to you about how to start learning leadership early. This is exactly what uh, the lady Bita Gerd from News Thomas Academy. She's a principal there. She has uh, asked why learning to lead early is important. So over to Neil to tell us why start learning, uh, learning to lead early. Why, how, uh, what? I mean, I, I, I will leave it to you. So it's an open discussion. <laughs> over to you, Neil. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Rita. Yes, it's a bit of a tongue twister of a name, learning to lead early uh, or learning leadership early. I think it, it takes a few things. Look, I think it's interesting that Jerry's introduced us to some of the, the benefits and, our, and our, the sort of narrative around why we would want to identify leaders um, early in their careers and how we should do it in a more systematic way. When I wrote this paper, my interest was not necessarily to have a really formal sort of um, uh, framework like developed best of, but was it was more about encouraging schools and individuals to think about how we could be more strategic about our leadership development. I think about my own development. It was um, a bit haphazard. I sort of was working in schools and I cho chose to sort of volunteer for a few leadership opportunities uh, and I worked in a whole lot of different places and gradually I think my leadership grew, but I did no formal uh, before I came, uh, became a principal, I did no formal training of any great sorts. And I think I, I ended up in the principalship and I don't think I was ready for it. Uh, I, I don't think I'd done enough work to uh, to make the success of my early principalship as good as it might have been. So I think the learning in those early, you know, in those first few years of me being a principal uh, was difficult for myself. And I think also for the people that I was leading because uh, I don't think like Jerry was talking about in our framework, I'm not sure that I was ready for it. So when I wrote this paper, what I was thinking about, and, and look, we've got some slides here. I won't necessarily go to the slides. I'm happy to share those with you later and it'll, it'll cover the main points that I'll, I'll talk about. But um, one of the things that, that sort of um, I think about uh, for me, and I'd like to start talking about, is one of the great passions of my life, uh, and it's it's been there for a long time, and it's surfing. And uh, Rita will know that uh, when she was visiting, we we went along the Great Ocean Road where I have a beach house and my surfboard surfboards are stored, uh, and it's one of the things that I really love to do. I found that I, I did it for you know some time when I was younger. I think I got busy with life and when I became a principal, I found surfing again. It was a for me, it was a form of meditation, being out in the waves, uh, out in the ocean, worrying about a wave and um, no, not necessarily worrying about sharks, but more worrying about the next wave that was coming it was something that gave me a lot of time to to um, I suppose to to think about other things, to get away from school and to be not thinking about school all the time. So so when I reflect on how I learned to surf, these sort of things come to mind. I was practice, a lot of practice, a lot of trial and error. You fall off a lot when you start learning to surf. Uh, you get some advice from people, you watch others, uh, you might watch some videos these days, YouTube, but back in those days, I think I was looking at magazines and reading a few books. Uh, and, and so the whole thing was quite experiential. I was learning in the work. And one of the things I think uh, also came was also a disposition. I loved it and so it was something that I wanted to do and be more successful at, uh, but there was also a bit of courage involved. I don't have that courage anymore. I now only go out in smaller ways. I don't go out in the really big ways. But one of the things that I didn't do in that learning, I didn't take any lessons and I didn't have any coaching. So 
I was uh, it was uh, it wasn't particularly straight strategic um, learning, but one of the things that 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 was there was I started early. I surfed from the time I was about eight years old. So my journey to surfing uh, and to learning about that uh, um, was uh, a long one. And in fact, I would say I'm a better surfer at this end of my life than I was when I was 19, 20, uh, 21. Uh, I, I think I've got more world experience. It's helped me to learn that a little bit better and and knowing how to learn a little bit more about these things. So so if we think about uh, if we think about then leadership and learning to lead, just those of you who are leaders now or uh, if you're not a leader now, think about people that uh, you've seen lead and think about the things that uh, they've done to improve their leadership. How have they learned to lead? What were the things that were effective, efficient? What were the, the barriers? Uh, what worked better in some contexts than in others? And what would you do differently if uh, if you could? If you could go back in time, what would you do differently? I think it, it's interesting because we don't often, even though we had a, the Basto Institute and we were doing a whole lot of work and, and, and it sounds like you've got your leadership um, uh, institute their um, Rita or some you know leadership programs we're often not that strategic about the way in which we lead so I think it's really important that we do begin to think about that because um, what do we know about leadership learning well as Jerry said most most teachers don't go into most teachers don't go into our profession uh, to be leaders uh, they generally go into teach and then they start thinking about leadership uh, and so we often start preparing ourselves or schools start preparing people too close, I think, to the taking on that leadership position. I think we need to start that a little bit earlier. Uh, and uh, sometimes the, the learning is happening in the job, you know, as I explained before, when I became a principal. So, so why would we want to start leading early? I mean, I think some of those things are really obvious. It's, it's, it's time in the learning. You know, if you can spend more time in the learning uh, and it's not so rushed, then you've got time to um, experiment, to fail forward, to take risks, to 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 take risks uh, uh, with uh, smaller um, uh, sort of high stake, less high stakes activities. Uh, I think there's time then to develop a style for yourself. I mean, one of the things that's important is, you know, I watch the way people lead and I. I tried different things, but I, I learned very quickly that I had to be myself. I had to be authentic. The authentic leadership, I think, is really important. I think leading, uh, learning to lead over a longer period of time allows you to, to succeed and to feel encouraged. I, I think I've seen some leaders, uh, we, you know, when I was an assistant principal, I had, uh, sorry, when I was a principal, I had five, in 10 years, I had five assistant principals. They all went off to get um, uh, other principal positions because of the sort of work we did together, the collaborating and leadership. They learned very quickly. I did have one of those people return and it wasn't a successful um, experience. And so he was discouraged, we worked together and eventually he did become a principal again, but he was able to step back. Uh, I think we get a chance to scaffold the learning like we do with students that you, you can try things and, uh, and you can begin to build your repertoire. Uh, and I think that it's, uh, why would we want to do it? Well. I think at the base of this is we know, you know people like Robinson, um, Vivian Robinson and colleagues of, from 2008, some of the work that, that they did and Ken Leithwood and colleagues that looked at all of the literature. Um, leadership is so important for improving student learning outcomes. Leithwood's work, he looked at all of the school improvement literature and he could not find any examples of a school improving its outcomes across that school without talented leadership. Couldn't find one example across all of the research and evidence. Couldn't find any examples. Now, people are going to go out now and find an example, I'm sure, just to prove me wrong. But, uh, you know, I, I think we know how important leadership is. So why wouldn't we want leadership to be good? Why wouldn't we want leadership to be great, not only for ourselves, uh, so that we feel good about what we do and are encouraged, but for the people that we lead? I'm sure we've all experienced uh, uh, situations where we've worked for poor leaders and how uh, uh, difficult that can be for ourselves and for our colleagues and how it often doesn't lead to uh, improvement in student learning outcomes because you have a very unhappy group of people. So I think there are some very uh, sensible uh, reasons about why we would want to do it. Uh, how would you do that? How would you start leading early? Well, 
I think it's going to vary for each of us. We're, we're all individuals and it's, you know, we know that our students learn differently. So why wouldn't we learn differently? Uh, and I think we learn differently in different contexts, a big school or a small school, a rural school, a metropolitan school. So I, I, whilst I think uh, there are um, things that will differ in terms of how people would start learning early, I think there are some common things as well, some, some common things that people could do. I think identifying uh, uh, mentors, and I say mentors purposefully. I mean, sometimes people find a mentor. I've had at various times up to sort of four different mentors for, for different things to get different views about uh, what I might do to get different advice uh, to learn from them. So mentors, I think is useful. I think encouraging uh, emerging leaders to volunteer for uh, 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 leadership opportunities that were within their scope. And as Jerry described, that, that sort of project thing or a small team or uh, those sorts of things. So I think identifying those, I think having a portfolio, including leadership, being very intentional about it, including it in your performance and development plan. Uh, seeking feedback. I think, uh, you know, we in education, we do a lot of work around feedback. I remember talking to a colleague who worked for McKinsey, big international research, uh, sorry, big international consulting firm. She was in charge of professional learning for uh, McKinsey in Australia. And she said it took about seven years to change the culture in McKinsey in Australia so that people uh, were really comfortable with feedback. And in fact, people sought the feedback, they wanted it. So I think learning to live with feedback is really important. And uh, we as leaders, learning to give really good feedback is, is really important. And I think helping these people to network, to meet other people, to to shadow things that we're doing, to, to, experience, um, to experience broader things. And then I think you can help them to sort of focus on particular things too. Uh, um, what are the sorts of skills, you know, where are they now? What's next in their learning? How do we scaffold that learning? What are the, the foundational things that they need to know? But how do we then help them move up on those things? And for me, the things that are important are knowing what you stand for. As a leader, who are you? What's important to you? What are your passions? What are your principles? And being uh, honest with those, with others, but also being true to them. So I think knowing what you stand for is really important because we know as leaders, we, we face difficult uh, times, difficult decisions, but if you're clear about what you really think is important, then I think uh, that helps you guide through those more difficult times. I know that uh, as a principal through the more difficult, some of my more difficult times, uh, I used to describe as if, if I can lie straight in bed at night, if I was comfortable with the decisions that I'd made, even though they might not be popular, then that was important to me and it helped me to, to navigate those more difficult times. I think you'll you see a lot in the literature about instructional leadership. I think, um, a good a good leader uh, early in their career needs to know how to to uh, lead to good instructional leadership. It's reading some work from the OECD about the growing importance or the growing evidence around uh, what the importance of instructional leadership in schools. For me, I don't think I was a great instructional leadership uh, leader when I was a principal, but I do like this notion of lead learner. I think I was one of those. I I, I didn't know it all and I was quite clear about the fact that I didn't know it all but I was prepared to go on the journey with my with my school to 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 learn what we needed to learn to be the lead learner and to model and to bring the school with me on those things I think self leadership is really important as well I think uh, we we need to look after ourselves as leaders. We need to uh, work out how we can navigate the difficult times as I've said uh, and how we can uh, stay healthy and sane and all those other things more difficult perhaps in the COVID times uh, and then of course leading others if you lead but no one's following then what's the point of your leadership why are you there if no one's going to come with you then uh, then you're in trouble so I think it, they're, they're, they're probably the things I think emerging leaders or leaders should start learning early in their career yeah cool I might leave it there Risha Thank you, Neil. And uh, you um, did mention I'm happy about the feedback, being comfortable with the feedback. It was extremely important. It's not just the ladder of leadership in any project, in any activity, in any system, in any setup. If you're not open to the feedback, how do we have those um, um, intermittent 
correction points and how do we actually diagnose and correct and move forward so that I totally understand and being a leader as a leader you got to have the final outcome in mind and how do we actually reach there. Yeah. I uh, specifically liked uh, what you mentioned as an authentic, how do we be the authentic leaders? Um, mm -hmm. uh, while we are learning, while we are learning from the environment or on the job or at times given tasks, a uh, uh, smaller project to lead and we accomplish whatever we have to accomplish. While we are learning all this, at times we are emulating, at times we are following orders, at times uh, we are taking certain risks and carrying on. While we're doing all this, we develop our own leadership style. So identifying you very beautifully brought out that aspect of identifying your own leadership style is very important. While we are on the job, while we are on the upscaling the ladder, while we are mm -hmm. middle leaders or maybe just teachers with little uh, mm -hmm. little more work uh, from your setup and your setup, things like that and coming to middle leadership, probably then coming to assistant head teacher or we call it vice principals here and uh, principals and eventually turning as system leaders all across this um, uh, ladder, all across this journey. There are certain uh, points uh, where you start developing your own style. Till you do not develop your own leadership style, till you're not self reflective, till you have not really uh, understood uh, how you would be effective. Uh, and uh, you've got to be comfortable under your skin and you've got to be natural. And that is how the authentic leadership comes in. You also talked about, rather, I heard your podcast and you just now again mentioned you talked about the importance of finding mentors in learning leadership. And uh, yes, you're right, not just one, but uh, different people for different aspects or uh, at different times in your career or different um, um, things that you're doing, depending on what you are at and what where you seek the learning. So uh, I really liked all that. And uh, uh, coming, I would like to uh, bring your attention to uh, the podcast that you had. Uh, uh, I heard your podcast at the best. Oh? Uh, in that you, I came to know for for information to all the audience. He also <laughs> has coached under 18 um, girls football team that has been, I mean, with your uh, uh, surfing and with this and with your work <laughs> in not for not for profit organization, being a principal and director to such a learning cell, great, uh, great learning center. I know your journey has been amazing in that. I would want to ask you a question before I come back to Jerry. Uh, uh, could you, uh, though of course you correlate the coaching to uh, leading or mentoring, but do you think there's a fine difference between mentoring and coaching or they go hand in hand for your take on this? Uh, yes, I think it's interesting because at Basto, uh, Jerry, we have had coaching as an opportunity for school leaders for gee, almost 10 years, I would have said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I know personally for myself that uh, I've had a leadership coach for about six or seven years, but more recently uh, we and it was actually part of our health and well-being program that a principal health and well-being program that the department was establishing and we we wanted to look more broadly at how we supported um, uh, principals in their role and we talked a little bit more about uh, uh, the notion of wise counsel, because the way it, you'll see uh, in is what you'll see in the literature is that coaching is quite a, a you know, and you can do coaching qualifications. It's quite a strong discipline around you know asking reflective questions, challenging the person, setting up a development plan, all of those sorts of things, which are very useful. So I think uh, coaching is a great thing, but we wanted something that was uh, not softer, but uh, more responsive, more uh, uh, in the style of, like I described, the wise council, where it was a more two way discussion about what was going on in the leader's life and uh, together sort of working through that and discussing it. And, and in coaching, often uh, my view is that the, the coach doesn't introduce uh, their experience or or necessarily give ideas, but they lead the leader to the answer for themselves. In mentoring, it's much, my view is it's much more of a discussion about, uh, you know, I've got a very difficult school board. How do I deal? Well, when I was a principal, I'm, you know, I'm the mentor and I'm helping you. When I was a principal, uh, we did these things when I had a difficult board member and I did that and so here's some ideas you might like to try and so uh, sorry that's a very long-winded answer but I would say less formal. 
there we go. Yeah, uh, Jerry, um, coming to you. While I was looking at your presentation, you talked about uh, something called unconscious bias. And that uh, word, the term has stuck in my mind. Uh, uh, does this something like this exist? Probably does here. Does it exist in Australia as well? If I've understood the concept right. And also, uh, I had a little worry in my mind. Uh, if something like this is in practice, uh, doesn't the organization lose out when something like this happens? That's right. So we all have unconscious bias and what we have to do is be more conscious of that bias. And the only way that we can do that is by having conversations with other people to get their perspectives. So this approach to the selection of our high potentials relies on people coming together to discuss what they see is important for the leadership in the school and then thinking about the people in their school and having evidence to discuss. So it's all based on evidence about where they've observed people doing um, great things with other colleagues or being exemplary in the classroom. So together they need to make that decision. Um, and it's a really hard point for principals to, to shift away from. I, I'm often with my teaching, we talk about this unconscious bias and how they need to select with their leaders. But unfortunately, principals will come up to me afterwards and say, look, I've already identified who I know should be the next leader. So I'm going to skip that identify phase and go on to develop. Um, and so they haven't really taken on the fact that this is a shared role that they need to um, have with their leaders so that people don't think that um, they're picking their favourites, that there's evidence to, to prove why they're selecting certain people to have extra development to go on to be leaders in their school. So if you don't use that process, you have a very narrow selection of what, what you're looking for in a leader versus what a broader group of people would be looking for. So it's opening up the diversity of who you're going to select. So you'll miss out on a whole lot of people if you don't have that broader view of who should be leaders in the school. Yeah, so it's been done. Yeah, uh, another question, I'll request all the audience to put up the questions in the Q&A session. We have already received quite a lot through the forms that we had filled up, you had filled up. And uh, I will uh, take these questions. Uh, we have a uh, Sunita Raji from uh, Elkhorn International School, uh, Delhi, who's asking how to keep the team intrinsically motivated. So uh, anyone can take this question. I think, I think I've got mute. Uh, yeah, that, that's a really that's a really good question. I, I think it probably starts uh, at the foundations. Uh, I've been doing a bit of reading and thinking lately about sort of collaborative leadership and how people work more closely together. So I think at a sort of foundational level, uh, you almost need to have a conversation about what what is important, what is important for each of the individuals in that leadership team. Take the data then and think about what's important in your school data. What are the things that we should be the things that we should be focusing on that that our data is pointing us to and and then sort of using that as the foundational pieces but then talking about how do we lead together what are the what are the what are the important principles about the way in which we lead uh, what are the what are the not negotiables what are the things so that we're consistent in our leadership with ourselves but also with the people that we're leading so uh, so in a, way, in a way, you you talk about data. Um, Jerry talked about evidences. So we'd have to yeah. not let our emotions run over whether we are choosing a leader or when we are kind of understanding the person. So evidences and data also have their place in uh, this that you talk about. Uh, I think uh, there's one Amit Kumar from CRT who also is talking in the similar line. And I think he also would have got his answer. He says how to get authorities to take into account the amount of time teachers spend in implementing. Basically, uh, it is also the question is also related to the recognition of teachers or intrinsic motivation of the teachers. I have another 
question from um, Radiant International School. Mr. Manoj Kumar asks about if any one of you could uh, elaborate on differences between leader and a manager. Jerry, would you, you take uh, any anyone? Anyone? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, it's a really interesting question, isn't it? And the way that we've defined leadership at Basto is that it's it's looking for um, those qualities in a person where they're looking at the vision um, and strategy across um, the school and and planning for that and, and leading people to lift them up and to lift their standards so that we can have better outcomes for our students. When we talk about management, we think of management around more the administration tasks. Um, so that's the finances and um, the day to day operations of a business. So, um, yeah, one's about the vision and future and strategy, whereas the other one's the day to day operations that are really important, um, but don't go to looking to the future of where you want to take the school and where you want to create more opportunities for your staff and your students. Would that's how you see it, Neil, or would you want to expand on that? Oh, oh. I'm also a little mindful of the time. Yes. Time wise, oh. we are just to, be okay. to wind up at 12, but I'm sure there are a whole lot of interesting questions here and uh, we'll uh, go a little over, over, we'll overshoot the time by 10, 15 minutes. Uh, I just need to tell Sonal, Anju, Shreya, Sanjeet, uh, Dalmia advisor and Divya, that your questions are interesting. We will take it up in the future webinars because they are not relating with the theme of today. So don't be disheartened. We'll be having subsequent webinars and we'll take up your questions. They are generally related to pedagogy and related to online learning, things like that. So we are not taking up these questions. Coming to a question which Divya asked for, are there tools and specific rubrics to measure competencies of leaders? The, yeah, uh, just to jump to that. So that's the leadership steps that I talked about and the capabilities, the five capability areas, we've built them out so that you can define what you should be doing in a classroom as a classroom leader. And if you want to step up into that middle leadership role. So we define those, we go deeper into what are the behaviors that you would be demonstrating, what would be the evidence to show that you are um, being able to develop to move into that middle leadership role. So yes, that leadership steps is a key to having conversations with people about what capabilities they're showing now and what they need to develop to move up to another leadership level. Yes. OK, there's another uh, question. Yeah, Neil, yeah, you uh, want to... And I would, I would just add to that uh, rubrics. So there is in Australia the, uh, the the professional standards for teachers and professional standards for principals. There's no professional standard for leaders other than principals, which we think is a bit disappointing. And at Basto, we have created a, a sort of a, a step in between, a set of uh, observable uh, things that people would do as leaders uh, on their way to principalship so people can can see things that they go. So uh, that's the Australian Institute for Teaching and School Leadership, AITSL. So if you Googled AITSL, A-I-T-S-L, uh, you'll see those yeah, professional yeah, statements. Yeah, I, I, I know, I'm aware, yeah, I'm aware, yeah. Uh, we have another, okay, question from uh, Sonal Rawat. She asks how to create an environment for emergent leaders to accept feedback constructively. They're coming back to the same uh, uh, talk of the feedback that we talked about. How to create an environment for emergent leaders to accept feedback constructively. How to make them reflect. It's important. I mean, I'm sure the self-reflective process are most important when you're trying to identify either your strengths or weaknesses. So how do you actually take the feedback uh, constructively? Uh, There's a head teacher from Delhi School. Yeah. For, for emergent leaders. Uh, very carefully. <laughs> <Would be. laughs> yes. uh, look, look, I think uh, I'm probably not going to say anything that people don't already know in some respects, but you need to have a relationship in which there is some trust. So you need to develop that trust. Uh, you need to base the feedback on uh, evidence. Uh, and uh, Vivian Robinson's work, uh, um, uh, 
um, what is it? Um, what's the title, Jerry, uh, um, of her work, Viviane's work? The um, yeah, you're talking about open to learning leadership. Open, open to learning leadership is very much based on that. Is having evidential conversations so that you can provide the feedback and give the person the evidence of the things that you're talking about. Because if it's if it's too broad or too emotional or any of those things and you've got no evidence, then uh, people are, are less likely to accept the feedback that you're giving them. I think I think and then it's just like anything. The more feed, the more you get feedback, the better you become at taking it. Uh, but we also need to be good at giving that feedback. And there's lots of literature about mm -hmm. the way in which you can give good uh, feedback. So uh, um, yeah. So I think it's important, it's, it's important to give specific feedback and if, if, if possible supported with evidence so that it is not a narration, it is actually an incident or a uh, yes. that you're giving a, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yesterday when we were talking, Neil, we, we were sharing and you mentioned that um, I mean, in India, that's a norm. I mean, if, if somebody is well qualified, has even little potential, the person aspires to be principal eventually. But you mentioned that it's not the uh, case in Australia and in, in your presentation also, Jerry, you mentioned in between that uh, they might come up to middle le leaders, etc. But then it's a big jump or big uh, nudging or telling them it is required that you can be principal or head teacher. Um, how do you circumvent? I mean, how do you actually come overcome this problem and how do you actually motivate people to be there and what actually makes or uh, in, it is involved to actually reach that? principalship eventually. How do you uh, because we have a lot of there will be certain cases in India as well who would uh, probably don't want to come out of their comfort zone. I mean they're capable. You can you do recognize the potential. You see that they have it in them and you they becoming a leader or head teachers or principal would uh, benefit students and the society at large because eventually whatever we are talking about it is all targeted towards the towards increasing the learning outcomes of students eventually. That is where we are. So Bob, your your take on this. Neil. Oh, I was gonna let Jerry take that one. Jerry could start. Okay. I just Jerry? mentioned since you have been a principal yourself and uh, Jerry could take that question from our side, yeah. <laughs> Are you taking it, Neil? No, you go. Oh, okay. Oh, well, yeah. th that's exactly right. So um the talent management framework, once you've been identified, actually talks to you about concentrating on a couple of areas that you'd like to improve on. And together with a mentor, and we use mentors in this situation, um, you develop up a plan about how you can approach developing those capabilities and building that confidence to be able to step up. And I think as you grow your confidence, you can see how you can reach to be a principal. I think when you're talking to people that are just that are in the classroom, that their whole focus is students and teaching. It's too big a jump to um, see how you could possibly take on the management of a whole school. So it's about looking at um, taking smaller steps and encouraging people and supporting people and talking to them about their, their strengths and um, building up their confidence to be able to take the next step. And that's what we're trying to do through this talent management framework. It's a long um, it's a, a long planning process. It's not about jumping um, next year into these roles. It's about thinking about how you might get there over five to ten years and taking those smaller steps and building up the confidence. So that's okay. that's what we're yeah. aiming to do. So I just quickly <laughs> add to that because I wanted Jerry just to talk about that sort of more formal structure that we've got. This was the argument in the, the paper that I've written about uh, starting to le learning to lead early is that we need to change the narrative about leadership and we can and we've tried to do that when we talked about having advertising campaigns in the system and things like that uh, people are discouraged because they see principals uh, really struggling with the role particularly with uh, parents that just the the sort of uh, you know in a changing society that that parents can be difficult to manage so what what our belief with the talent management and and in my paper about starting people to learning to lead early is that we need to change that narrative over time this is not a quick fix in australia it's changing the narrative over time that leadership is great you, you came into this profession 
most of you came into this profession with a moral purpose about improving student learning outcomes. You can do that in a classroom, but if you become a leader and you become successful at leadership and you enjoy leadership and people seeing you enjoying that, then we change this whole narrative that leadership is great. You can have you can expand your impact in terms of your moral purpose and that it doesn't need to be hard. I think that's what I found. It was hard for my first two years, but for the last eight years, I, last, last eight years of my principalship, I loved it. I totally loved it. And the only reason that I moved from, from being a principal, I was looking at other schools, but the only reason I moved from uh, into policy work in the central office is uh, I could have an even broader impact by working in policy. Is, so that is, but that's, that's, I think, we need to change the narrative that leadership is great. And if you're good at it and, and you can be good at it, then uh, it's great for you and it's great for the system and you can totally. Totally. Have a really really. Yes, if we can correlate with a moral purpose, I totally get you. If you keep uh, correlating with financial gains, etc., it doesn't always, um, I mean, of course there is a difference, but then yes. it doesn't always correlate to that. So it has to be, you should be feeling for it. You should be uh, mm. mindful of the fact that the kind of impact that you would eventually be giving, not to those certain set of students, but to society and to the uh, the entire the way world is developing, the, the, mm. the, the, how the humankind is actually developing. You are contributing to that. It's a it's an immense immense sense of responsibility and it's yes. an immense immense uh, sense of satisfaction eventually. Yes. So I totally agree with you. Yeah. I'll take some more questions from the audience and um, and I I still have a lot of my own questions left, but then I think the uh, participants deserve their time. Uh, we have. Um, OK, Anushna Jha, she's an independent researcher in education. She uh, wants to know what in your view is the role of uh, role of creating community partnerships, particularly with the parents, families of uh, students to foster effective uh, leadership. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, parental engagement is very, very important to us also as the Indra Pram group of institution. And uh, till we do not have um, community partnership. So how do we actually, what is the role of creating community partnerships? That's a very, very interesting question. Uh, uh, over mm. to you. No, I'm not deciding who takes the question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll go first this time, Jerry. Uh, yeah. And you can add if you'd like. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a really good question. And as I said before, I've been doing a bit of reading and uh, because I'm interested in doing a bit of writing about collective leadership and, and how we involve uh, people uh, in the the things that we lead and how we lead and I, I i'm coming to the realization that i, I think collective leadership uh, is about a leadership right across a school and a school community that i think we can involve parents and students uh, and our staff in leadership of the school that in fact we bring people together when they feel a sense of being able to influence and be involved and own the things that are happening. Now, this is, this is a challenging concept because sometimes, you know, I knew with my school board, I just wanted them, I just wanted to get the meeting through and I wanted the things that I wanted done, I wanted those and I would sort of manage all of that. Uh, but as I then became more experienced in my principalship, I allowed that, I, I had the confidence to let that go and to take other ideas and involve people. So uh, I think that that uh, intersection of all players, all stakeholders, we know that that makes a big difference if we can get it to work. I mean, there are some downsides to it. It can be pretty complicated. Uh, I noticed in one of the Q and A, you know, the difficult people. How do you get those in? Well, you know, that's that's I, I, ever, I think it's that's ever been done. Yeah. That's a downside to any participatory leadership as well. Yeah. Whenever you're doing things in with participation and including more people, the process is slower, but I feel the process is surer. So yes. uh, there is a yeah. downside to it that takes more time. You got to take more people on board. Uh, and uh, I feel parents have to get involved. I mean, without parents community not being on board with you or not in sync with your thoughts or your uh, ideologies of the school or vision of the uh, institution, you don't really achieve anywhere. After all, it's their children that we are rearing up and it's our children that they go back uh, to their home. So it's like um, yeah. parenting or learning or teaching or mentoring. Everything is home, happening hand in hand. Uh, rather than the schools that I lead, we have a project called Samanwe, which is a Hindi word for bridge. 
So that is what it is. It is a bridge between the school community and the parent community. We don't just do the formal sessions with them. We also do a whole lot of uh, informal sessions with them. It could be a one mic. It could be a cooking together. It could be a lot of things that we do together. This is to bridge or uh, make friends with them firstly. Then uh, in the formal setup, we have a whole lot of committees, whether it is a um, uh, say advisory for uh, of course, uh, the formal parent teacher association. Of course, that's a norm. That's a guidelines. We got to follow that. Otherwise, whether the committee is related to safety or whether it is related to our uh, say tinkering lab or it is related to. So what happens is, I mean, uh, such an amazing thing happened when we're talking about safety. Uh, instead of we devising our evacuation plan, there is one parent who did the evacuation plan for us. And there is another situation where parent comes to us and does audit our safety systems. And when uh, it is so it it's trust, not just one way. I feel is a trust two ways. We trusting that parent is not trying to I mean, take the feedback constructively and he's trying to so, and we amend ways and I think a very, very beautiful question which uh, generated all of discussion. Thank you for that. Uh, let me see any more questions. Yeah, we have. Uh, Shuchi. Uh, I do not know where she speaks from with school. OK, she says, what are the challenges we face when we are learning to lead early? Learning to lead early, so we need to give the perspective of the not the mentor, but the mentee. So what are the challenges that the mentee feels? I assume that's what she needs to know. What are the challenges we face when we are learning to lead early? Yeah, uh, I think one of the challenges and we see we've saw this a few times at Basto, Jerry, didn't we? That uh, the principal and I suspect because they hadn't necessarily identified the potential wasn't giving opportunities to people. So uh, I think probably one of the most important things is, is volunteering for that, is indicating that you're interested in leadership and you'd like to learn about it and to uh, then engage with whoever's, you know, you know, your upline manager or other leaders. Uh, and uh, then, as I said before, I think you need to be quite strategic. How, how, what, what do I need to learn? What do you think? So, so understanding that and then working out how you're going to learn that. Now, if the principal doesn't believe that you have the capability or doesn't want to or, or your leader doesn't want to uh, be engaged, then uh, you need to find other ways of doing that and you'll just probably get less support out of the school. That does make it more difficult. We, we have found that, Jerry, haven't we? That yeah, there were some people yeah, who, yeah. who ended up there, but we hope that the sorry, you, you talked to it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I was just about to say one of the other challenges that people have when they're learning to lead early on in their career is stepping away from their peer network. So, you know, you're in the classroom with your colleagues and then you need to step up and then you're having to lead them. So that can sometimes feel a bit lonely and challenging because you're having to take on that a new role and it develops up new relationships um, or having to redefine your relationship with your colleagues. So sometimes people aren't willing to take that next step because they don't want to be feel that isolation or that changing relationship. So that can be challenging, I think, for I some of our early leaders. No, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, OK, then we have another question. Um, what are the aspects of assessing our leadership skills? So our own OK, whether developed or yet to develop. What are the aspects of assessing our leadership skills? Whether develop, I mean, from what I understand, it probably means that how do we assess ourselves whether the leadership skills have been developed in us or not, probably. Yeah. So yeah, basically, self-assessment is what we need to. How do we yes, assess? Yes, yes, yes. I'd be interested, uh, Rita, uh, what things you use, but what comes to mind for me is, uh, yeah, we we. Sometimes we don't know what we don't know and getting that feedback from others is really important and getting the 360 degree feedback. We at Basto uh, invested quite a bit in opportunities for people to do that. Our aspiring principals uh, program has an assessment where you can do a self assessment uh, and if you pass the self assessment, you go on to this quite rigorous uh, assessment that involves uh, port submitting a portfolio, 
doing an interview, uh, doing a set of questions and having five or six people do a 360 degree rater system on you. So, so uh, if you don't have access to those things, then you know I'd be asking trusted colleagues to 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 give you feedback when you lead something or uh, you know when you do some of those things. So there's some of the things. But what about you, Rita? Do, do you uh, you uh, might not want to talk with a whole lot of your colleagues listening? <laughs> until till you haven't really plunged in, till you haven't really gone in, till you haven't really worked it out yourself, till you haven't really been on ground, done that job. There is no way to assess your. You can feel confident. You can feel yes, it works here. If it works here, it works there. I am sure about it. But mm. you must run through whatever you got to do in your mind. If it runs through here, and till you do not take the plunge, till you actually do not take those responsibility. And while the process is on, while the project is on, while the task is on, do not feel ashamed in going back to your leader, mentor, or whoever you think you can get uh, ideas from. And let's have uh, should have little uh, uh, intermittent points where you can check yourself. Things are going fine. No, uh, no harm in going doing a course correction also while you're uh, at it. So be open. Uh, trust yourself. All right, prepared. Got to be very, very well prepared. The only way to identify whether you've developed the leadership uh, leadership skills is to take leadership uh, role in smaller projects to begin with. And uh, rather now that you speak about it uh, uh, in the 11 years of 12 years of leadership in the school that I headed, I've just left that um, school and I'm only in the director's role now. But uh, from that particular one school we have today in the environment we have today, 10 principals and about 25 middle order leaders. So in these 11 years, so that is a kind of uh, called on it was. And it had to be, I mean, it it has to be, it cannot be a coincidence. And I don't know whether we followed any fixed framework, uh, but yes, the only thing is the moment we identified a potential leader who had those traits, uh, there's always a mix. I mean, I'm sure it's not just the learned. I mean, there's no debate whether it's learned or innate. It has to be right mix. There are certain innate uh, uh, skills that we have or features or the strength we have, and then we learn to improve over it, uh, create those extra uh, sharpen your edges and things like that. So uh, when the people, the potential leaders were identified, they were thrown into different positions. Like uh, we have various department. It could be academic uh, curriculum leaders. It then the, you have so a lot of things in schools that happen. It could be uh, your uh, time scheduling of the lessons, or it could be your drafting of uh, planners. Uh, so uh, we always uh, put these people two years in each department. And when a department had say, suppose four members, two members would be old hand and two new members would come in where the mentoring would happen and handholding would happen. And the older ones in the department or in the committee or section of whatever domain of uh, within the school would move out to another uh, section and then they would become the mentor and they will take other fresh mentees. Uh, this was one thing very important. Secondly, it was also important to not have hierarchies. Hierarchy somehow uh, that I, mean, I believe in the world being flat. What happens is uh, I may be say head teacher of a school, but suppose I'm not very good at performing arts and I want to learn certain skills of how the events are done in performing arts or say functions or large scale functions when events are done. I get attached, get attached to a committee where I have a head of performing arts who's leading the committee. I become that person's mentee. So you could be a mentee here and a mentor there and a mentee here. This is the only way to probably uh, learn. I mean, you've got to be open. You've got to trust yourself. You've got to trust your mentor. Your mentor has to trust your mentee. Do not feel ashamed and going up and saying, OK, somehow I'm not able to figure this out. Could you help me? And this is how probably it has worked for where I have led the organization and um, that's it. Building their trust in the beginning itself is very, very important and that can only come with good work. So do you work very, very nicely initially, then come into the mentor's role and that's how it probably works. Yeah, so let me see if there are more questions and I am also can see that we have overshot 15 minutes. We should be um, OK. Yeah, we take one last question from Kavita Derek. She happens to be the principal of the Asia Pacific Convent School at Rajasthan. Does the seriousness affect the exercise of feedback from members of the organization? Uh, what do you? Does the seriousness affect the exercise of feedback? 
from members of the organization. If you could understand the question, uh, Neil Jerry. Does um, the seriousness. Does the seriousness. Uh, so was affect the exercise of feedback from members. If it, if it, oh. you go on, Joe. Oh, um, it's a form of um, interpreting, you know, the formalness of the process. Yes. Does it affect um, the relationship? And well, I think um, we brought some formal um, approaches to this because it was very ad hoc. So um, once you've selected the person who's been identified and you set up that mentor relationship, you know, trust is built and it be becomes a more casual approach to the development and the support. The formal piece is that we make sure that you commit to mentoring them on a regular basis, that that doesn't fall off when you get busy um, and um, it slips by the wayside and then you get 12 months down the track and you haven't progressed your development. So the, the formalising it is to make sure that we don't lose track of what our aim is and how we can support that person um, progress um, and learn on the job. So it's a balance. I mean, we, we need the um, formal process to make sure that there's the um, equity and um, the rigour in how we select people. But we also and have to have the processes to support the development, but but then the relationship builds from there. So um, no, I don't think that it's an, a negative thing. I think it's just build some structure around what we want to do. And, <laughs> and yeah. probably what, I, what I would add to that is that, uh, as I said before, I think you know a few mentors is not a bad thing. So I would be, you know, a number of the mentors I've, I've had are outside my organisation. They're, they're people in other in other organisations or in other schools or other bits of the education department or in the education sector more broadly that that uh, I've identified. Not that they're just going to tell me nice things though. I want people who are going to challenge me, who are going to uh, uh, not just let me try and spin my uh, um, what I'm doing and where I'm going. I want them to be able to really work with me. That's yeah. right. And, and we ask people, um, you might have uh, one formal mentor in your school, but you'll reach out and develop connections beyond your school as well too. So that's really important about that support process that you're trying to look beyond the schools about who can help you grow your leadership potential. So not just relying in the school. Yeah. Thank you. This is this last one question. Then we do the closing uh, remarks from all of both of you. Uh, there's one question part. It is already partly being answered. I think leader in the same institution where you have progressed as a teacher or leader. Uh, I think you've already talked about it. I think Jerry talked about the being lonely and you were one of them and now you're uh, one of the leaders. So we'll not touch this portion. But then second part of the question says what challenges might one face in the scenario where a leader was a teacher in one institution and goes as a leader in another one in the same institution. We did uh, touch this point. Um, can you just uh, we can take up this question and what are the challenges a leader feels when he has been a teacher in another one and he takes up a new position in a new institution as a leader? So what are the challenges a person feels? I, I just want to reflect some of the data that we see is that people want to stay in the same schools and if they don't get um, a leadership role in that school, they'll just, if they're happy there, they'll stay. Um, but a lot of our experienced principals tell our teachers, you need to go to different schools and get different experiences um, so that you have, when you become a more senior leader, that you can draw on different experiences from a different school. So we'd be encouraging people to to stretch beyond their own school and have experiences in different schools. So it, it's interesting, the culture in our schools is that people like to stay in the school that they're, they're in because they know the school and they look for the leadership opportunity there and they don't necessarily want to move across to a different school. So there's not a lot of movement across right. our schools. It's a comfort of being yeah. in a place and then uh, probably not only that when you are leading a group and the human resource that you're used to you are able to 
optimize the uh, work out of the human resource who you know what are the strengths and each each uh, subset each person is a subset of a bigger set how yeah. effective school leadership or the uh, school would be in uh, uh, say increasing learning outcomes of students would actually depend on the uh, subset these uh, teachers so probably that is also one aspect yeah. But, it's yeah. our better, but our better leaders are the ones that had broader experience across different schools in different um, areas across Victoria, you know, smaller schools, larger schools. So they're the better leaders in the end. Yeah. Sure. I suspect I suspect the challenge is uh, going, you know, from a leader from one school to another uh, is uh, establishing yourself, establishing your credibility, uh, people uh, viewing you as um, uh, uh you know as as credible and uh off you know, with authority you know or not authority in terms of you know being able to tell people what to do but knowing what you're talking about and those sorts of things uh, i think that's the challenge i think getting to understand the school and its cultures uh and uh the the, the school's evidence and data and what it's on about and where it's going they're all of the challenges i think of going to a new school and then i think there's the challenge between the challenge uh, between uh, watching and looking and learning, at, but also getting some early runs on the board so you get that credibility. But um, I, and I think there's a balance in there, and it'll depend on the context and the circumstances of the school. I think what can often be hard, and I had this situation when I was appointed as an assistant principal into a school, was uh, you know someone had been acting in the position, and I replaced her. Uh, well. Um, some people take that very graciously, others don't, and will make life very difficult for you. So, and that was my experience. <laughs> you could give your closing remarks uh, while you're talking, Neil. I mean, let's have your closing remarks uh, for the session. Uh, look, I, th I think probably my uh, closing remarks would be that leaders owe it to themselves and to the people and the organizations that they lead to do their learning to do their leadership learning early uh, that uh, leadership is so important in terms of improving student learning outcomes that uh, we should be strategic inclusive and quite intentional about helping emerging leaders um, uh, to, to learn leadership and as leaders ourselves uh, or as emerging leaders ourselves, uh, being very engaged in that. So that would, that would be my points. Thank you. Jerry, your closing remarks. Uh, I think the most important piece that I'd like you to take away is to think about unconscious bias. And if you're a leader out there, how can you work with other um, leaders in your team to be more open to uh, leadership potential in your school and how you can come together to make those selection so that you broaden out your leadership team and also to be strategic about developing your leaders. So going to those early leaders and thinking about them, OK, how can we build their leadership over five years rather than thinking about um, building them over short periods of time? How can we build opportunities to help those early leaders progress? Um, so they're my take outs. Absolutely. And thank you, thank you, Neil, and thank you, Jerry. It's been absolutely, but absolute pleasure to have you here. And it has been the last one hour, a little over one hour, has been again a lot of learning, and uh, it does uh, put you into a little reflective mode at times and things like that. And uh, and all the future leaders who are listening to us, um, just go ahead, get into whatever you think you're good at, try out even those things which you are not good at because uh, uh, gone are the days when you the jack of all and master of none was a bad statement it it isn't anymore you've got to be jack of most and uh, all and master of few that is the new mantra so try to do that and uh, do not get disheartened if your potential is not recognized move ahead world is big so with these thoughts, I thank uh, Mohit from Onefold for being a huge support to us and thank you for inviting us to collaborate with you. And uh, we have had Deepa and Ashish as a back end people who have uh, supported us today. And uh, yes, last thank uh, to the participants who have been uh, giving us wonderful questions. We'll be back with you 
with more webinars and um, thank you neil and jerry once again thank you thank, thank you, you thanks for the yeah, opportunity thank you yeah it's lovely to talk to you guys we're getting back together again <laughs> yeah. thank you thank you bye bye, bye all bye.